Hi, and welcome to discussions of music, healing, and consciousness with your hosts, Chris Noble and Bill Protzman. In today's episode, we're going to talk about 432 hertz tuning, its effects on the human body, and also the history of this tuning. Why do we tune instruments to different concert pitches? What is a concert pitch? Why does any of this matter? And how does it affect us into this day and age? We're going to go over lots of many different areas regarding frequency healing, tuning, how to integrate 432 hertz tuning into your everyday life. We will go over the history of sound and frequency healing and all of the interesting innovations that have been forgotten but are being rediscovered in this very day and age. We'll be covering topics like that and much more as always in our wide ranging conversation here on discussions of music, healing and consciousness. It's October. Yeah. May the fourth be with you. May the fourth be with you. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I uh, I was just getting off the phone with a friend of mine uh, back in Ontario, um, and he is a musician and a very ascended, you know, conscious human who is, <clears throat> you know, he's trying to incorporate a lot more 432 hertz tuning into his music. And so I thought maybe today, or at least to start the conversation, we could simply talk about tuning like what what kind yeah. of a difference just just something so simple like tuning your instruments and right. you know what what like i started i recorded my first ep having shifted the concert pitch from 440 hertz to 432 hertz and as you know but i don't think most people and honestly i don't even think a lot of musicians really know that there are other concert pitches right so for the listeners, what is concert pitch? If you've ever listened to an orchestra and you hear them before the performance and they're all tuning their instruments when you hear all that collective noise of the strings, they're actually tuning to an A note. They're tuning to a particular note that is a specific frequency that's been predetermined and standardized. And then everyone tunes to that. And then that, then that's helpful because then we can use guitar tuners and tuning apps and all those things are, are basically tuned into a concert pitch and that pitch is 440 Hertz. So everyone's doing that most pretty much 99% of the music you're listening to is, is tuned to that concert pitch, but there are other pitches, other frequencies like 432 or 440 and, and many others. And my, my last couple of years of experience tuning my music to 432 Hertz versus 440 and, and nothing changes for the people listening to like my music doesn't change. The songwriting doesn't change. It just sounds a little lower in its uh, tone, but man, uh, from experience, I, I really find that I've sometimes done, you know, like I AB it, like I'll contrast it and I'll play the same thing at 440 and then the, the, the same music at 432, 432, I, I get more people commenting like, wow, I, I really love the feeling of that. Like I, I just dropped into the music more. I, I, I was really captivated more by it. And then I felt myself kind of lost more in it and things like that. And, and my friend who I just got off the phone with, he's a performer back in, in Ottawa and in, in Ontario. And he's saying like, dude, I, I uh, was playing some shows this summer and I, and, and he would a B it just like me where he would play two songs at normal tuning. And then he switches guitars and plays at 432 Hertz for a couple of others. Doesn't say a word to anyone else. And it's when he starts playing at 432, all of a sudden people that are at the bar watching the hot, the watching the hockey game or something like that. Um, all of a sudden start paying attention to him and they started dropping into his music. So he's, he's had sp- experience that that really does do something. I've had experience that really says that this tuning does something what what have you experienced, Bill? Like, and then we can get into the science later. But like, have you experienced anything with that kind of tuning change? I've only done that in internal in the studio. I haven't actually done that performance wise um, until very recently. The external performance stuff that I was doing all involved a real piano, right? And getting a tuner to tune one of those things, you know, is a couple hundred bucks to change the whole it's instrument. A, it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah, it's a pain in the butt. But now with keyboards and stuff, so you can change. At will, pretty much. Uh, you just dial it down. You could be one click, two clicks, you know, whatever you like. And whole transposition can take place, which is really weird, man. If, if, you know, if you're used to hearing something in a certain key and then you transpose it, like using a guitar capo, mm. it just feels weird when you play it. <laughs> so your, your brain is going, no, that's not C anymore. So um, limited experience. Although 
um, Christmas or so of 2019, or maybe it was 2020. I don't remember right now. It's been such a crazy couple of years. I decided just to record some uh, yoga stuff, yoga music. And I'd done that before at 440 using uh, the keyboard, Tibetan bowls, which kind of don't matter, and uh, native flutes. And I suspect that if you really got into it, you'd find that those ancient instruments are more 432-ish than they are 440-ish, right? Uh, there's so many overtones going on in Tibetan bowl, if it's a good one, that the ear is probably not gonna suss that out and really know, because they're just gonna hear the, the, the ethereal nature of the instrument, right, is gonna come through. So um, don't know, I could try playing along. I've got some like recorded stuff I could mess with, but uh, personal experience, I'm encouraged. I mean, I, I'd love to try it out. I've been sitting out in Balboa Park here in San Diego with a keyboard and a battery and a speaker every Saturday while my wife teaches art class. And I thought, hey, maybe I'll try dialing it down as you're talking and see what 432 does using the same kind of setup and audience, basically. I, I highly recommend it. Um, and that also, just on a side note, sounds so soothing that just that imagery of pl you playing your keyboard. Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> with your wife doing the artwork. I actually passed by a group doing something similar here in Vancouver. And I'm like, yeah. wow. I mean... That sounds just fantastic. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, give it a try and see see how people respond. I mean, it's not maybe across the board, but I really do find it uh, fascinating of how much, how such a simple transposition and tuning change can make such a massive difference on the exact same piece of music. Yeah. And, you know, the one thing I can get into with the science of that is, you know, obviously we know from quantum mechanics, everything is in a state of vibration all the cells in our body, everything that makes up matter is in a state of vibration. And if you look into the work of the, um, why am I, I always forget and I blank on the famous Japanese scientist who did the brilliant work on the water. Ice crystals. Yeah. Yeah. What and is his name? I'll go find out. Keep yeah. Talking. Thank you. Yeah. You, you do that. And I'll keep talking here. So that, that this amazing Japanese scientist did, uh, yeah, incredible research for decades actually on how water responds to emotion and how it responds to different frequencies. And he did test 432 Hertz, um, under the microscope versus 440. And you can, you know, you, there's probably memes and stuff now that go around showing this contrast, but if you look at the cells or the water crystals from 440, and then compare them to 432, the 432 crystals are far more crystalline, more geometric, um, more, oh man, more, um, just more symmetrical and, and they look healthier from a very intuitive and kind of, kind of more beautiful. You know, they look beautiful. They look like snowflakes. They look like gorgeous, you know, crystalline structures. 440 is, is not so symmetrical and it's not so, um, yeah, it's not so beautiful. It looks a little muddy sometimes and it's a little uneven. And you're like, that's affecting every cell in your body is going to start to look and resemble to that shape a bit. So it actually does make sense on a physiological level. If you're changing the tuning to resonate with the cells in your body, it makes sense that if you're going to a more therapeutic tuning, it's going to have more therapeutic outcomes. So why 432? I mean, let's talk about this just a bit for people who don't know. I mean, and, and I'm even curious about this because there are frequencies that are very meaningful that are slightly off, like 432 to 440 isn't that far, but why 432? Well, that, it's a question I've been asking for a long, long time. <clears throat> and I definitely won't pretend to have the ultimate answer for this one. Um, I think for me, it started and, and it came from research into ancient civilizations. Um, for example, the Great Pyramid that we've talked about previously, you know, I've had some great experiences, uh, experiences there in Egypt and in the Great Pyramid. And the Great Pyramid has 432 all over it. And what I mean by that is um, when you measure the Great Pyramid, it was built with a measurement system called the Royal Cubit. The Royal Cubit is um, a very, very ancient form of, of measurement that goes back to ancient Egypt and probably beyond that. And I think it actually lines up with our met the metric. I was going to say our metric system. You guys, I don't have the metric system, but most other countries do. And it does match up, I believe, uh, relatively close to the metric system by sheer coincidence. Anyway, that's not really important. The important thing is, is that the Great Pyramid has, when you measure it out by the qubit and you start to get all the numbers and you start to get all the ratios and all the statistics of what makes up this building, the structure, it all comes back to 432. 
um, in terms of a ratio that continually pops up. And then they measure the distance from Earth to the moon. And it's roughly, not roughly, but it's like four, it's something like 432 million kilometers. And then the distance, um, I, and these are, I'm, I'm definitely not doing the right numbers, FYI. Like this is not the exact amount of zeros, but the, the core beginning numbers to these distances are always 432. And it could be 432 million, billion, a thousand, whatever it is. So the distance from the earth to the sun is 432 billion kilometers versus 432 million to the moon and back to the earth. And then the Great Pyramid itself is built exactly um, to scale the exact same size as planet Earth, which has this ratio of 432 again. So, I mean, that alone just got my curiosity going. Um, and then where it's gone from there as to why I use it is because of my experience where I could see it really helping people. Uh, and then looking into the research of uh, the gentleman that you researched, uh, Marasumoto, yeah. I believe, is the Japanese guy, um, scientist. And his work also really started to convince me that, you know, look, if I change the tuning, I might be able to help people on a, on a physiological level with the music too. So that's kind of what started it. But do I have all the answers there? No, like this is an evolving um, science and art. So this, this magic number, um, is it something that you arrive at mathematically or is it something that is more fundamental? Like ancient Egyptians are sitting around figuring out what pitch is the most beautiful one or something like that. And they decide, Oh, well, this is the pitch. And it turns out to be 432 Hertz. Yeah. I mean, like, again, your guess is as good as mine at this point. I, I really, I really don't know because it comes back into our history time and time again, you know, the music of the spheres, yeah. And, and, um, you know, people like, uh, the, in the ancient Greeks were talking about the mathematical, um, perfection of certain types of music. And then that would lead into their architecture, which is, you know, uses sacred geometry, sacred geometry has similar ties to these yeah. sacred numbers. Um, Nikola Tesla would always talk about the power of three, six, and nine. And if you look at the 432, well, four plus three plus two equals nine, and so, you know, that number also has, you know, these numerological um, powers, if you want to call them that. So it's, it's, it's interesting, Bill. Like, I don't know, like, have you heard even just like through the grapevine and whatnot, like what other people talk about when they refer to 432? I'm sort of in the classical world and uh, there are recordings, like whole recordings made at that pitch just because, you know, some producer decided they wanted to do that. I haven't done the AB comparison on that kind of thing, but I've done the, the guitar comparison. There's YouTube videos you can go and watch the same performer play the same piece on in two different um, tunings, 440 and 432. Mm -hmm. And um, I can tell a difference, but I can't tell you what it is, is the way of, you know, way of saying it. Um, I think we talked about this at one point, maybe a couple of months ago, before we were recording episodes. And I know that I prefer to play an A flat, 432, mm. versus A, 440. Mm. And um, if you had an ancient guitar, theoretically, if you had an ancient guitar, uh, which is tuned around an A chord, you would actually be tuning around an A flat chord in the 440 world. So there, there's a resonance around certain fundamental like acoustic instruments that I think probably lays in better in 432, not only for the instrument, but for the the person uh, listening to it. I don't know that for a fact, but my personal preference is 432. And, and you know, after getting involved with some of the dipping the toe in the pool, you know, and saying, oh, it's this 432 thing all about, it made sense to me. Mm -hmm. I just feel better in a flat, right? And the flat keys, basically. So everything is, a, is shifted in that direction for me. Mm -hmm. Why? I don't know. And certainly when, uh, a lot of that stuff was composed, a lot of that classical music stuff was composed. There was a, a certain amount of disagreement about what the concert hertz should be. Wasn't it standardized in the early 1900s when somebody yeah. chose 440? Uh, around World War II, from what I heard. Okay. So um, prior to that time, um, I don't know, A flat would have probably sounded like G. <laughs> <laughs> or A. I mean, it depends on where you are. Well, that's true too, because in Europe it could have been different, right? I've heard uh, 444 hertz is another interesting uh, wow. concert pitch, right? So people just sort of randomly chose 
You know, if you're in in Italy, this is what they use. Or even if you're in Rome, it's different than if you're in Sicily. I don't just know, like knows? the food, just like the food, right? Just like the food, right? Yes. Right. Why <laughs> can't music be as flavorful? <laughs> exactly. Um, and, and I wonder now, as, thinking about this, so worldwide, um, a guitar player these days can go any place and pretty much play in tune with any with anything that happens. But think about all the places in the world where the guitar is sort of fundamental, like all over South America. Uh, a good part of Spain, they have similar instruments in the Middle East. Uh, who decides, right? And and is it a matter of just what feels good? Guy sits down with an oud one day and says, hey, this is how I'm going to tune today. Everybody else tunes around him and off you go. But there are instruments that can't be tuned. Like if you're playing along with a wooden flute, you know, like our modern harmonica, you get one in every key. But if you're playing along with a wooden flute, I mean, how do you know? Do you tune to the flute? Or <laughs> it's like... Somebody had to decide. Some guru had to say, no, this is the pitch, right? And, now, and what I find interesting about that, Bill, you brought that up because like I've heard, um, you know, ancient, some ancient instruments and I've had the pleasure of sometimes being able to play my own piano to these instruments. And one of the other ones, uh, like you mentioned, the Tibetan singing bowls and crystal singing bowls. Yeah. And I have uh, quite a few friends now who are all sound therapists, sound healers and I, uh, first of all, playing music over top of those sounds is one of the most fun things ever. Oh, isn't it great? I it, love it. Oh my God. And I love improvising kind of classical, very light, angelic, you know, sort of uh, melodies and whatnot over top of the bowls because it's just uh, ethereal and euphoric and it, it feels really, really good. But anyway, I noticed um, when I was recording my first EP, I actually put a crystal bowl in one of my dance songs um, subtly in like the bridge and another kind of part of one of the songs. And while I was going through the recording process, because my album was all tuned to 432 Hertz, um, I had to kind of figure out I'm like, well, what am I going to do with the bowl? I mean, it, it's easy enough to record something and then actually tune it afterwards, but it's not the same. Like if you're not tuning it from the core source of the sound, it's going to be a little different. It's the, you know, it's still probably better, but um, anyway, I can't tune a crystal bowl. It's just built the way it is. Right. Like you're mentioning. Right. Flute. But I found when I was doing the recording, I didn't need to shift the pitch. It was already kind of working at 432. <laughs> yeah, it's not wild. That's interesting. <laughs> it, I, I don't know anything about tuning, except that it's good when it's tuned. But all of those crazy things that we do to bend the pitch at either end of the scale, the lower and the higher, and you know, when they, when did they come up with uh, equal temperament tuning? Uh, the, the scales that you can hear out there, and there's YouTube videos, anybody can go and, and find them hearing those different kinds of scales uh, presented boggles the mind. And there are a bunch of them, you know, microtuning kind of stuff and all of that. But I suspect that the Tibetan bowls, maybe in the crystal bowls, work in a way that is broader. So that they're not about like hitting the, the melody note exactly in the center, right? They can be, you can bend them and they still work. And, um, and that for me is fantastic. I think the human ear is really, if we ever get around to studying how it works, you know, like at a real deep level, we'll get to some insight on this. But it's it, very forgiving, the human ear. <laughs> it is. And it, you just made me think of, um, you know, with like classical Indian mu music, for example, their scales are on a whole other level because they usually can insert three notes where we have one note, uh, where we're going to go from an interval, which, you know, we, talk, we, go, we call moving up one note a semitone, well, within that one note, when you're moving up from a C to a C sharp in classical Indian, that I, as far as I know, and I'm certainly not very well educated in that, just from what I've learned, is uh, you can squeeze about three more notes in that one semitone when it comes microtones, to microtones. Yeah, that's the microtones. Okay, okay, then that's yeah. what. Okay, yeah. So you know, like I mean, when you listen to some of that music, does it not have a, I don't know, a spiritual effect on you in certain ways? Maybe because they're. I don't know. They're in yeah. between these frequencies and they're, man, I'm, I'm falling it, with the language right now. I can't you know, e it. even, um, well, it's not popular music, but there are people who are getting there in pop music who can sing the microtones mm -hmm. and it sounds so cool when you know it's intentional. I wish I could come up with a list of them. Just off my head, I can't. But um, I, I like that we're playing with that now and that wherever the source, maybe it's classical and Indian music is getting, is bleeding over now into something else that the Western ear is becoming interested in, mm. you know, and hearing those microtones and they're done with such intent that it sounds right. 
even though it could be perceived as like out jazz or something, uh, it, it just sounds right. And yes, more spiritual. So people are like taking the, taking the melody and, and shifting it just a bit to expand our, I don't know, it's not our mind, expand our, our soul experience of the thing in a way. And, and I think that's an important invitation. It's probably existed in Indian music for so long, people don't even know anymore, but it's new to Westerners. So we're, we're consuming it for the first time in on sort of en masse and finding a new way of being able to dig into music that way. I wouldn't recommend anybody go out and sing microtones around a popular tune. <laughs> but if you're a jazz improv, imp, improviser and you've got the chops, I mean, vocally, that must be amazing to do. Right? It, it must be, you know, like... Um... I, I think, you know, another really incredible thing about looking into the ancient Indian, you know, music and, and culture is it goes back so, 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 so far. If you look at the ancient Vedic texts and they talk about how a lot of crazy things actually they talk about, but they, they, one of them is, um, is how the music really and sound were used as the main source of, of medicine back in the ancient, ancient times. And, you know, we kind of gloss over that or, or straight up ignore it now. But ironically, we're, we're rediscovering a lot of these modalities in science, you know, now. And, and, and we've talked about some of these in the past, but these, this sound and frequency healing, I guarantee you, this is a lost form of, of medicine that we, we had maybe globally because you can find it in ancient Chinese as well. Like, um, yep. Like in all that uh, that that culture as well, India and and certain tribes even in Africa. I mean, how many would do healing cer- shamanic ceremonies with drumming and with other sounds, chanting things of that nature, and then building cathedrals or buildings that would facilitate even more of the sound and even more of the sonics and acoustics to help elevate and heal people even more. And we we lost that in the last not even that long really because even in like the 1800s people were still at least going to church and having big sing-alongs and regardless if you're religious or not it's those very very spiritual and euphoric experiences when you're in a cathedral type environment and singing with more than three people yeah uh, you know it's 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 incredible and I know you can speak to that a lot Bill like it's it's a it's a feeling um, yeah it's such an incredible feeling. And that kind of feeling, like if we've been deprived of that in the 21st century and most of the 20th century, you know, you start to see how stressed we are and anxious we are and all the cancers that are popping up everywhere and only increasing. And you kind of wonder, you're like, you know, maybe this modern medicine thing uh, needs to get a bit of reapproached and, and incorporate more of the frequency, more of the non-pill, non-prescription based or pill, pill prescription based medicine where we're going a different route. <laughs> yeah, headed away from... But you know something that's interesting to me? There's um, a lot of research right now, of course, in music, but there's a lot of vibrational research, right? And vibration is sort of sound. Um, Mm -hmm. The universe is a vibratory place. People are starting to appreciate what that really means. And notions like the music of the spheres have come back to us when we hear sounds of the wind on Mars, you know, or the sound of the sun. or like there's uh, There's this new sort of interest in the sound of where we live. That's all around us. Uh, forest bathing. Uh, what else have we talked about? There's, there's, there's so many things going on, and and I'm curious if there is. Um, I, I, how do I say this? The knowledge is pretty esoteric still, but I wonder if it was secret on purpose, or would it have been something that an ancient Egyptian would have known? You know, when they walked in the pyramid. I, I'm pretty sure that folks who walked into like the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris would not have any idea at all about the science of what's happening inside that place. I mean, this is what, the Middle Ages? But maybe there was some secret knowledge that that made the architectural uh, sort of specifications of that place what they are on purpose. And isn't Notre Dame the place that's sort of bent? It's not like a straight line from one end of the nave to the, what do they call it, the no, apse? Th- there's, there's never um, full on like, there's always, it's always ratios in sacred yeah. time. Right. Yeah. So it's it's never like a full rectangle. It would be a, a smaller square with a longer rectangle, and they, they create these spiral. When you when you trace them out, they create that spiral pattern all every time. The same spiral you see in a galaxy. Fibonacci or, sequence or whatever. Exactly a Fibonacci sequence. The it's the mathematics of organic growth that's found all over the universe. So you're building mathematically to the same ratio that creation builds everything else. 
So when you build a structure, because we build, especially nowadays, it's like it's cost effective and cheap and fast to put up. And yeah, it might break down in 10 years, but who cares? We'll be millionaires by then. I mean, that's kind of how we build right now. And that was not how we used to always build. There used to be a lot more intention with what was going on. And, And I think what happened is in the, the dark ages, which we talk about in history, where we just don't know what was going on. But I, I say the dark ages in terms of human consciousness, where the last couple thousand years, I would say, we definitely did a decline. Because if you look in ancient Chinese and ancient Indian, um, just a, as an example, or like the Mayans, Aztec, I mean, they were a lot of what we learn about is their warring and barbaric times. But when you can go deeper into their history, you'll find that there was such universal wisdom and knowledge, knowledge that was shared by cultures across continents that were supposedly disconnected and had no way of of, of literally creating the same types of pyramids they'd build the same. Um, Ideas of uh, mummification and of the afterlife were all very common. Ideas of a, a great flood that reset humanity was very common and a bunch of other things. And so when you look at those ancient uh, people and what they were doing with how they built things, I think they had more public knowledge back then that then started to come into a period of darkness on a consciousness level where it became dangerous to continue to have these um, pieces of wisdom that ultimately liberate and and uplift humanity. And because it teaches you of of the, the universe and God power that we have inside of ourselves, And so, of course, that means we're not reliant on external forces that want to control us, like, you know, the church and the dark ages and things like that were much more oppressive. So things I've heard, like the Knights Templar, for example, seem to be one secretive group that kept this knowledge and were a part of the building of the ancient Gothic cathedrals that we find in the Mediterranean and stuff like that. And then the Gothic cathedrals were basically taking the remnant energy or um, information of ancient Egypt and other pyramid cultures And bringing that into the cathedrals. And then now to this day, there are sometimes churches, even in North America and other places that go back to that old tradition of building a sacred geometry. And if you go into any of them, no matter what walk of life you are, you walk into any cathedral that's got sacred geometry in its uh, stained glass and in in its architecture. And you're always like, wow, that's just the reaction is wow. It's like the, the 432 reaction. It's yeah, <laughs> actually, it's yeah. a good point. Just it's always like large. This, it feels good. It just you feel better. So yeah, I don't know. We need to feel better. I, you know, this is um, there's got to be studies on this stuff out there, right? I mean, I hate to tell people to go and do their own research, but there's probably research that supports this. Yes, that's thousands of years old, as there is with most of things like music and art that are thousands of years old, there's always something spiritual behind them somewhere. Somewhere. You know, like the, the whatever those cave drawings you see from way back in the day where people have mushrooms and, mm-hmm. you know, it, it's, there's some through line here that's much bigger than, even bigger than 432 or sacred geometry. There's something else that we're striving for, I think. And these are sort of manifestations of it. Yeah, 432 hertz better than 440 because it's more spiritual. Okay, so that's a big mouthful, but maybe that's the truth, right? Yeah. And um, and who cares about the reasons why? Just go with it, right? It's- Just go with it. And I think it's this, it's just like we're connecting on consciousness. I mean, that's like the kind of common thread here is that what did all these things do? It, it basically just aligns you with who you are. And, 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 and that's it. So, you know, sometimes illness and, and disease and other, all these things are actually just vibrational um, conditions that are actually a lot of the time and cancers are also them too, where they're based off of deep emotional traumas or yeah. deep uh, psychological issues that yeah. are completely repressed, never dealt with, or even shamed for being there. And so they get so deeply repressed that physically, They'll manifest into different things like cancers, tumors, um, heart problems. I mean, you name it, right? And so these vibrational therapies, these uh, sound healing and things like that, really like they can cut through so much of this trauma and, and disease and illness in such a quick amount of time because they're bypassing so much and just going straight to your cells. Yeah. And vibrating your cells into a more harmonious vibration, which literally could make all the difference between you having something as severe as cancer and not because this is actually a great segue into, and I think you've seen some of these works where you've seen uh, cells vibrated 
um, cancer cells vibrated by, by sound and frequency. Um, yeah. Do you see, have you seen some of the stuff like that? Yeah. I, I, I think it was when we were talking 40 Hertz a while ago now, and I went off and started just looking for these things. And there's a few Ted talks now out there. Um, somebody started a company that's based on using frequency to, it doesn't actually kill cancer cells, but it kills something that's like the precursor. And as that thing dies, it's better than chemotherapy. As that thing dies, the cancer has nothing to feed on. So it dies as well. Mm. And um, that, that's fascinating stuff. And, and all by uh, playing a sound that you can't hear. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. But, but that's, that's, uh, what is that called when they're when the singers break the glass by singing the same note that the glass, the resonant glass. frequency. Yeah, so resonant the, frequency. Yeah, so the the frequency is found to resonate. Some guy did a whole bunch of research, like micro research, frequency up by what he use one or two hertz, just every step through every frequency to see what would happen. And um, and fortunately, we've done that work. Now we now we know exactly what the frequencies to pick. You know, to go in there and get them, whatever it is we're after. I suppose that there's positive effects to that too. Like if you wanted to stimulate the regrowth of tissue, there'd probably be a frequency for that, or um, I don't know, fix your hearing or your eyesight. I mean, LASIK is cool, right? But maybe there's something else, right? That, that, that we could use here. I'm just spitballing on this stuff, but why not, right? Why not? I mean, if you think about it though, even LASIK, I mean, that's laser and laser is light. It's, it's, it's concentrated light. And what is light? Light is frequency that we pick up with our eyeballs, but it's still yeah. frequency. It's still so part of a frequency spectrum because everything is frequency. So, you know, we we call sound sound only because it's from twenty hertz to twenty thousand hertz, which is what our ears hear. You know, and then and then we call frequency that we see we call it light. Um, but it's all frequency. So you know what I mean? Like if you're shifting. Uh, anything you're going to affect things. Uh, if you're, if you're specifically putting out very particular frequencies, though, they will affect something. And, you know, there was a, it's a really interesting rabbit hole. If anyone's interested in going down, it's a bit more conspiratorial, but it is fascinating. If you look into Royal Raymond Rife, and he's an early 1900s, um, very, very incredibly intelligent um, medical doctor, scientist, and inventor of the Rife telescope, or not telescope, microscope. <laughs> microscope. The opposite of that, um, the very small, not the space. And uh, he was able to go into the cellular structure more than anyone else at the time. And he started to find resonant frequencies to all these different cells, uh, cells of different diseases, illnesses. And he, he created that whole book. And I have a friend of mine who uh, went, there's a museum still in the States somewhere that has this book. Um, have you heard of it by any chance? I have. I've, I've heard of Rife Frequencies. Haven't heard of the museum. I suspect there's you know some sort of an archive. So yes, hooray! They, at least they haven't destroyed all that, right? They destroyed the they, tele, uh, the sorry the microscope. They, yeah, they destroyed. <laughs> and didn't they run him out of the states? I mean, he had to. Did did he even disappear? survive it? I can't remember. I I've, don't remember. I either, don't even but, know if he got out of it with his life because he highly controversial. Highly and controversial. Strangely controversial. To me, it just seems weird that we would do something like that to a scientist. Yes. But uh, I mean, again, without going too far down it, I mean, if you look at Big Pharma and their initiatives, I mean, it completely destroys their business plan, like completely. Yeah. And they have they have trillions and trillions of dollars to make here. So that would be one pretty big motivator for them to, to do that. But this, the nice thing is that I'm pretty sure his book is still around. And uh, obviously his research has permeated and, and resonated and continued to go. And people still refer to things as rife frequencies because he was, he was the first person or he was the first person to rediscover these things. A veteran but, that I know is playing with a, a rife frequency machine right now um, related to health issues that he has. Okay. And I'm, I'm really curious to see you know, how it's going to go for him. You know, I'll keep you I mean, posted if we get any. But what does any that response. look like? Bill, have you seen the machine? Do you know what that looks um, like? He held it up over Zoom, and it looks like a small gray box with a handle. Okay. And he didn't like open it up and show anything, but it does connect to your computer, so it's you can control it with software. And that seems like a pretty good idea to me. I uh, I just googled it here as we're looking, and uh, wow, this looks amazing. This is uh, this looks really cool. Yeah, so it's a, just a device. Looks like a little computer device, and. Um, Wow, that's really interesting. Uh, I, I just and as I googled this, of course, there's an image that pops popped up with um, um, 
how did uh, how did Royal Raymond Wife die? And you know, accident or conspiracy? And there is a uh, an actual newspaper article, and I do remember this where they actually, um, they almost they had they gathered a, a whole bunch of the world's leading scientists. I think people like Einstein and Tesla were invited to this, and and were there. And there was a photo of it, and it was a celebration of the end of disease. Wow. Or, yeah. Like, yeah. And, and so they were celebrating this because of his discoveries and they're like, wow, I mean this, like we, anything you got, we'll find a frequency for it and, and we're good. Yeah. And then a week later, his, you know, laboratory is completely destroyed. All of his equipment is gone. And once again, I can't remember, but I don't, I don't, I think he may have had an accident, an accident, quote unquote, yep. um, within that same week. And he's, unfortunately he, he, he's no longer with us. And, uh, Anyway, <laughs> it's didn't, interesting. Didn't, uh, similar circumstances around Nikolai Tesla's destruction. Well, why are we never taught about the greatest scientists in the 20th and 19th century? Exactly. We hear all about the, the uranium folks and the Manhattan Project and all that, but we hear nothing about uh, Tesla. More patents than pretty much any other scientist in history. Um, our whole electrical grid, we wouldn't have without him. Every time you yeah. plug something in the wall, we have him to thank for that. Uh, not just Edison, because Edison was hell bent on ending Tesla, yep. and still couldn't because Tesla was just too damn brilliant. But um, yeah, why don't we learn about him? You know, yeah, uh, he's 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 to, he's. It, I think one of the main reasons is because he wanted to give us free energy, and he wanted to give us free energy so early on. Um, the Tesla Tower down in Colorado Springs um, was that um, well was his invention of creating wireless electrical energy. You, I mean, it's even referenced in many, many Hollywood films at this point. Um, and it's filled with mystery because it got built. And then JP Morgan was like, wait a minute, we can't make, we, we you're, you're going to destroy the oil industry and we really can't tap free energy. Like how do we make money and profit? So they kiboshed it. And because Tesla, I think had a much bigger, um, mission on this planet which was to bring peace and and harmony to the world yeah in a time where that is not the current uh thought for the powers that be that's why he was snuffed out and um, driven into obscurity and they you know he was driven into old age and obscurity into his hotel room which when he passed away in his hotel room in new york city i think the cia and fbi were the first on the scene and about 60 percent of his um things of Nikola Tesla's journals and, and, and all of his work, all of that's been confiscated. It's still top secret. It's still, Seriously. yes, it is still to this. That's how advanced his stuff was. He was going into technologies that only today we might be getting into. Like we're talking, he would talk about time travel and portal tech. I mean, so advanced and, and the CIA thank, thankfully, not thankfully has most of his stuff now. So we're like, you know, I don't know if we'll ever find out about that. <laughs> now, at least we know where it is. Yeah. But other, other, inventors, and <laughs> other inventors and even hobbyists have figured out how to do some of that stuff just on their own. I saw some video, you know, how you're reading through the news and there's a thing that says, uh, you know, free energy, blah, 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 click here. And there's a, big webinar that lasts 45 minutes and you find out you can buy the how-to kit for $49 when you're done. Yeah. It, that kind of thing. But um, hooray, right? More, more of that, please. Because we're in a place where the, you know, the, we're, we're so handcuffed by medical technology, by energy technology, by uh, the computer world we live in, plain old technology, technology. It's, unless it makes a buck, uh, it's, it doesn't see the light of day, which is really weird to me because there's so many things that we need there where there are really great ideas that are out there, like this whole thing about sound healing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's ancient. Why aren't we doing more of it? Why aren't people teaching each other to do this? And, and here in the West anyway, it's still sort of, a, a, it, it's sidelined. I mean, we have, what do they call it? Alternative and, um, alternative therapies. There's, there's medical yeah. words that allow us to show up, you know, as music therapists or whatever, and, and participate in a clinical alternative situation. medicine, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But it isn't the same. I mean, if these are tools that everybody can use, like having electricity in your home, why should that be a regulatory issue? Right. Electricity just makes life better. 
for yeah. many people. Why wouldn't we want life to be better for many people? <laughs> Why would we deny that to people who would otherwise thrive if they had a little heat and light? You know, it just seems crazy to me, especially it, if it could be free. It is. And by the way, hey, big susceptibility because look at our dependence on metal t- medical technology now. We can't even agree on what works for COVID. Yeah. You know, let alone um, a terrorist susceptibility of the electrical grid. Yeah. It wouldn't take much to take out, you know, pretty large chunk of North America for a good period of time. Well, and forget the electric, I forget like it, it being even a terrorist thing. Like, uh, you know, we experienced a solar flare back in the late 1800s yeah. that wiped out all the telegram stations at the time. But luckily because it was still mid to late 1800s, there wasn't too much electricity and too much of a grid at that point in history. Of course, fast forward to now, and it would be catastrophic yeah. if a solar flare like that were to occur today. Well, that only happened less than 200 years ago. I mean, that's a blip in terms of time and space and the Earth's timeline. I mean, so the likelihood of that happening, not to be doom and gloom and and, and to freak people out, because I don't really like doing that either, but it is important to, to also just recognize, like, we're in a very fragile, very fragile position here. And it actually makes a lot of economic and safety and health sense to get off this grid and get, get independent with our power. Yeah. And so again, these technologies that, you know, are apparently are, are have been around for so long. I mean, these are things that we need just for uh, the survival of our species really um, because it's not sustainable. The, the way we live is just in no way sustainable. Yeah. Look, a, a hurricane comes along and people are out electricity for a week. You know, why is that in the world that we live in now? Right. We can do better than that. And then there's places like Haiti where, we, we must do better than that because yes. you just can't afford a population to be that decimated. Uh, just comparing the difference between uh, an earthquake in Haiti and an earthquake in Oakland. Remember the big one that collapsed the freeways and all that it was terrible, mm. but it wasn't several million people that were all of a sudden without food, water, shelter, you know, warmth. It's, it's just, um, it, it's weird to me that we can live in a world like this where we don't do a better job for other people. So I talked I talked to this futurist on the uh, podcast that I co-host and it was talking about AI. And this was a medical doctor who's also a poet and his assistant who's also a accomplished musician. And they're up in Edmonton. And we're talking about AI and you know the big scary thing about AI is it's gonna take over the world, right? Everything's AI is gonna take over the world. Mm-hmm. And, his response was, well, it ought to, because look at what the mess we've made. <laughs> but th- awesome. that there's a humane aspect to this, right? So if artificial intelligence has all the information, it decides, hey, it's probably better to do electricity a la Tesla than it is to do it a la Westinghouse. Uh, isn't that a plus for humanity as a whole, right? And the planet? And the planet. I mean, just think about it. And, and maybe we need AI to be able to say that to all the techno lovers out there so that they'll get it. Or to all of the, the I hate to put words on it, but to, to all of the greed, if you were to say, hey, greed, that's not good for everybody. Stop. Here's the alternative. Now, probably a lot of people wouldn't go along with that, but some would. And if it became an election issue, you know, more would. But I'm thinking too hopefully here because I doubt that AI is ever going to influence politics the way it needs to. Well, who knows though? Who knows, Bill? I mean, I mean, we're 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 seeing our whole world shifting on a, in, a, in a way and to a degree we've never ever would have guessed. I think yeah. I certainly couldn't have. So if I've learned anything over the last two years, it's that anything truly is possible on the negative and the positive. Yeah, it can go either way, right? It can really go either way. And it comes back to like the intention of, of the, the the collective and, and us and like where we want to see it go. And one of the things I've heard about AI that I find fascinating is it's it's about the consciousness behind behind AI and, and, and who's creating AI, humans. So right. it's, it's how we're thinking and how we're feeling and going through life that is ultimately going to be it, let's let's think about it this way. If we're continuing our warring ways, our divisive ways, our very violent and abusive ways that we have in the past, and I know we're not because we're already shifting out of that. Uh, and I just don't, I don't see it as our future at all, but, but as at the rate we're going currently in the past, that is how we usually would go through life and things was power domination, et cetera. And AI would learn that that's what it would be learning is that way of life. But if we shift it and and take it into a more loving and inclusive 
or uh, and 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 collective and community based, you know, collaborative environment, then AI becomes that. AI becomes that. It, it becomes something that, like you said, it actually would be extremely helpful for us because it would point out all these amazing solutions. Because when you there's a lot of things going on right now where if you just looked at it actually on a piece of paper from statistics alone with no politics, no religion, no other stuff behind it, it would actually be quite obvious what we need to be doing. I feel right. I agree. Like you look at what we're doing, you're like, well, I could tell you what we shouldn't be doing, which is pretty much everything right now. <laughs> True. Like if if you could core dump into AI all of human history. Um, the weight of it would be on what might make the news, right? Yes. But there would also be in that human history things like the fundamental goodness of humankind mm -hmm. would be in there. It might be something that's covered over by a lot of history, but it would be in there. And um, to be completely hands-off about it, just load it all into AI and let AI make some choices. I suspect that we'd find out that things like sound healing and you know the whole power grid, I, the, all of the infrastructure stuff uh, would just make more sense in a very compelling way. Um, I occasionally have this argument about healthcare because you know when you're in the music business, you bump up against healthcare frequently, and um, it just makes sense that having more healthy people is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hello, and, and <laughs> if it's too expensive to do it one way, and it's less expensive to do it another way, why are we continuing to choose the expensive way? I mean. That's not even an AI question. It's just like a bonehead logic kind of a question, right? So, so how, do, how much does the cancer treatment cost? I mean, seriously, oh, you got God. chemo, whatever, oh. it's six figures and up. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't know. And that's in, in both of our economies, both in America and in Canada, that's a huge impact on the economy mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason. Somebody pays for that, right? And, and, and it's, it's a lot. And there are a lot of people with cancer. And so the ending cancer is a good thing. But how about beginning health. <laughs> How much would it cost to begin health? Mm. And if the, if the cancer treatment could be done using frequency, right? That's more effective and costs almost nothing. Why would that not be a good choice? I mean, it just, from an economic standpoint. At the very least, to give us some serious thought and experimentation, come back with some peer-reviewed science, like give me all the facts and information. If you can come back and tell me that it's all hogwash and, and it won't work and our chemo meds are better, which obviously I don't believe for a second. However, yeah. if the science came back and the science was saying, well, Chris, you know, uh, statistically speaking, um, you know, the, the, the chemo that we've got is still better than this frequency, then I would be like, okay. And then I rest my case and then you're yeah. absolutely right. But I just want to see the thing is, is we just haven't got a lot of science to, to show this still. And we, there's so much, um, there's so much for the other, for the, for the funded, you know, pharmaceutical side of things. We just don't have the same science to back up the alternative, the other, the other alternatives that are out there. But like you were saying, like, doesn't it make sense to at least experiment with those and to trial and error and see like, well, couldn't yeah, we show us what's a better up. way? The, the people who are on that, the frequency for cancer kind of thing are at the leading edge. And I am really actually surprised that they're that far along. There's an actual business that does this because the, the agents of suppression, <laughs> be whatever they may be, mm -hmm. are vastly more well-funded and um, eager to keep their profits going. And, you know, I imagine that treating cancer with frequency is profitable too. It's just not profitable in the way that it would be if you had a lock on uh, cancer medicine or cancer research or cancer. I mean, cancer is a big deal, right? A lot of people would lose their jobs if you could cure it suddenly. I mean, look at cancer charities. They are huge. Well, and they do amazing work, right? Yeah. They, they, they've made all this awareness where we didn't have it before. But getting down to it and actually fixing something, right? Yeah. I mean, suppose that we decided somehow we could pull the lever and everyone in the world would now suddenly tune to 432 hertz. And we were able to measure the effect of that globally. I think that I think the the statistics, the metrics would be compelling. I, I think so too. And I would love to see that. This is why there's conspiracies as to why was the frequency um standardized during World War II and right. apparently this idea did potentially come from Germany at the time. Um, and they were using, I mean, they were masters at propaganda, as we all know. 
And one of the ways it wasn't just the TV and the news propaganda, but and the posters, but it was the music. They yeah. used they used music to keep people in fear and to keep them more uh, in a state of yeah you know, compliance, so that they're easier to dominate and to you know make them do whatever you want them to do. And so you, you know you do have to wonder like well you know just the tuning of everyone around the planet is listening to music almost every single day. Those frequencies are coming at people all over the place, shopping malls, you know, work offices, you name it, back at home, wherever it is, like that music's coming out of the radio, coming out of speakers, and it's at that particular frequency. If you shifted that globally, like you said, to a much more therapeutic and healing frequency that we know is in 432 hertz, wow, that could, that alone could make a huge impact. I mean, like you, you, you get statistics sometimes of monks who come over to Washington, D.C. and meditate for a week and you see crime rates plummet during yeah. that one week. And all they did was meditate. They didn't go out and stop crime. You know, they didn't go out with police and, and hold up more people, arrest more people and and solve it that way. No, they came and they meditated. So, I mean, that's still on something more frequency and vibrational. And what if you tuned music to 432 globally oh my god what a cool experiment well that'd be cool and you know i get it if you're a if you're a symphony and all of a sudden you're going to go back and re-record all of the recordings that you made it's crazy you're not going to do but, it but you know, well I mean, maybe you could do some but go for it right why just why stop forward like all the new music you start to do just start doing new stuff like try that frequency now for a couple of new albums you know give it a go see what happens i'd love to see if the, on the score the composers that are writing these days have written a equals 432 mm. i'd be curious anybody who's listening out there if you know you know yeah write I would love in to see. and tell us Please do. You know, I, what I would love to see is like, where is 432 being used uh, outside of, you know, the obvious, which is like this therapeutic music meditation kind of, you know, community yeah. outside of that, where, where else is it, is it being used, you know? And, and is some classical music, I know, cause in classical, that's the genre I continuously hear where they do sometimes alter the concert pitch for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Mm -hmm. And is why is it that it's always classical music that gets played in the gardens and in all the green spaces where they statistically show this so much that the plants have like four X, four times more growth, health, yeah. et cetera, listening to classical music. I don't know. So do you have up in uh, up your way, places like 7-Eleven and McDonald's that are playing music outside? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I haven't paid any attention, but I'm guessing it's probably still 440. The intention here is to keep people moving so that you don't have homeless encampments in front of your 7-Eleven. And so there's one just down the street from us that's always playing opera, mm. <laughs> which you know, is the last thing you want. The last thing I would want to hear, actually, if I was stopping to pick up, you know, a gallon of milk or something or buy cigarettes or, you know, uh, what, uh, <laughs> right, you've got Pavarotti. And not that I I love Pavarotti. It's just that's more like cafe music for me than 7-Eleven music for me. Yes. But I wonder if the change from 440 to 432 in those isolated sort of places might have a different effect on whatever whatever the effect is that they're after, keeping people moving. I, I, who knows? But this is this is an interesting experiment. I'm I'm actually um, <laughs> I'm intrigued by this. You I could know. do one of those real time maps to show where 432 is happening throughout the world. That would be cool. Track it to uh, you know whatever the news reports of those places might be. See like oh, that's crime statistics and stuff and or, right right, like right. Health, health statistics and see if there's any correlations. I mean, I know in Toronto, my 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 old hometown, there is one subway station that had a very particular like had a, a much higher crime rate uh, a lot of lot of crime a lot of a um, lot of uh, incidents things like that would always happen at this one particular subway station more more than any of them else i mean it's a big city and you know, crime happens everywhere but the this particular subway station was very synonymous with this so what they did was they 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 put in um it seemed pretty experimental at the time especially for government to do this but they played classical music at this subway station all the time, like on repeat 24 seven, even when they were closed and <laughs> go figure probably know where I'm going with this crime rates completely dropped, completely yeah. and utterly dropped to a point where it's on just as, just as much as any other subway station, if not even less probably. And they still play it to this day. 
And I don't know, but there's that's got to be a correlation, right? So you've seen the video I know on YouTube of, I think it's Joshua Bell playing in the subway station. Mm. So this guy is standing there. Of course, there's hidden cameras or whatever to capture. He's standing there playing a Stradivarius, uh, some of those com- complicated classical music in the world, and people just are walking right by. Mm-hmm. But without, without fail, at least in the video, the kids were the ones who stopped. So um, I don't know what the future for classical music looks like, man, but if the, one of the world's greatest violinists can stand in public playing one of the world's greatest violins with some of the world's greatest music, and it's ho-hum to everybody, we've got some work to do, man. There's an <laughs> educational component here that is missing, <laughs> right? Yeah. And not a, not, a, not a granular one, just one that's an awareness one. You know, like people are aware of cancer thanks to the cancer NGOs. And so that helps, you know, promote fundraising and blah, blah, blah. But if there was some awareness of music's power outside of the, the esoteric, I mean, we're talking pretty esoteric stuff here. 432 versus 440 hertz. I mean, that's a conversation that, musicians can have, but the rest of the world. So there's awareness that we need to pump into that somehow to say, Hey, I don't care what you listen to jazz, death metal, whatever, but try four, three, two, <laughs> Give it a try. You know, maybe that's our campaign and, uh, and, and see what happens. I mean, that like, because we know now, like we, we know with quantum mechanics that this isn't just esoteric, you know, total jibber jabber now because it it, it, yeah. and it was for a long time and you know we do actually have more and more science every day coming out to to actually bring far more credence to these theories and these ideas that once again are extremely ancient have been around a long 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 time we're just rediscovering now rediscovering the science that actually proves these things yeah. and so it, you know it is going to be becoming i think a lot more accessible and knowledgeable for people because because we're understanding who we are and, and what, you know, even makes up our own reality, which is vibration, you know, and people say, one of the things I always tell people that, are, you know, when I start to talk about this stuff, the dinner table or whatever, especially with like, you know, my, my friends or family or whoever it is, you know, they'll be like, all right, well, you know, like, that's like, that's great, Chris, but like, you know, like where, where's the evidence? I'm like, well, no, I mean, we actually have evidence now, like quantum mechanics proves that everything is in a state of vibration. Okay. Music is obviously vibration affecting our cells and our body, but then even more so like what happens when someone walks, you know, you meet someone for the first time. And and when you, you, you talk about that person afterwards, a lot of people will say this, but like, Oh, I liked his vibe or I liked her vibe. Right. You know what you're you're saying, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Vibe vibration. You're talking about the vibration Vibration. that emanates from all of us. Cause we all have frequencies coming at us, coming out of us. And because everything is frequency. So we're literally even acknowledging that the way we feel about someone is, is in reference to a particular frequency. It was a positive vibration, negative vibration. I went into this really nice cafe, had a great vibe, had a great vibration. Yeah. This isn't chance. This isn't just a random word we throw out. This is there's a reason we say that, you know, there's a real intent there. And, and seeking that out um, when my wife and I fell in love, it was one of those instantaneous things. And I don't know how science explains that. Maybe it's an electromagnetic sink, but it's definitely a sink, right? And that happens before you even like touch. There's some connection that takes place. And some people say they see it in their eyes, eyes are the windows of the soul, whatever. Mm. But I think it's more fundamental. And, and the vibe I think is where you're where it is. There's a there's a synchronicity between vibrational energy that is a, a it's it's like the uh, where are they waves where if you get waves syncing up they they peak higher mm. right and the troughs peak lower that you get a bigger um, amplitude out of that and it's resonance and it's, it's resonance it's just resonance, resonance. Yeah, it's just resonance this is some spectrum of electromagnetic or vibrational energy that ranges from you know the vibration of the earth which is I don't know what it's really it's slow uh, I forget what it's like seven yeah. hertz or something I think yeah it's like from all the way to ultraviolet light or whatever on the very far end mm. and x-rays and stuff we can't even I mean that it's vibration right it's it's out there and um wouldn't it be great to hear all of that I know well maybe maybe that's what happens when you uh leave this physical plane when you pass on and uh leave this body. And maybe that's when you're able to get out of, because again, our body is, is limited with what it can perceive in terms of frequency. 
Um, that's why psychedelics are so interesting because they open up a lot of that. But even still, like, you know, when you exit this, this vessel, perhaps maybe that's when you hear the beauty of like the whole, you know, universe. And maybe that's, that's actually a really, that's why people who have these near death experiences come back and say like, Oh, I was so much nicer. on the, yeah, I liked the it much better. <laughs> well, that, you know, maybe the big bang is actually still happening. The echoes of that are available if we were able to Not measure true. them or hear them or experience them in some way. I mean, I feel like that when that, when strange feelings come over you, it's like, you get that spine tickling, tingling thing, ASMR, whatever it's called. Mm -hmm. Something's happening there. And it's usually not from a stimulus that you know. It's just like, wow. I mean, if you can practice it, tying it into things. But it's so much fun when it catches you by surprise. That's incredible. And one thing that just popped into my head, maybe like a, one of the last thoughts I have here on this, this tuning and frequency and whatnot with our bodies is we got to remember, too, that and this, is, this is all very, very standard science. Like every... Thing that we've really been oh, talking yeah, this is all about. basic like, stuff we can say it's esoteric because it feels esoteric when we're talking about it and, and maybe when we dabble into the spirituality it gets there but a lot of what we said today is all very very scientific and, and i encourage everyone to to please do as much research as you can and let us know if you find anything else but we got to remember that science tells us that we are 99.9 percent .9 empty space what is matter matter we we call matter things that are made of molecules and atoms, electrons, protons, neutrons. Well, when you look at all that on the quantum level, there's so much space in those things that we consider our, our matter, what make up yeah, the physical solid. Growth. Right. So it makes so much sense that if we're really just basically particles of energy floating around that in this third dimension kind of congregate to form some form of matter, solid, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Us us, then, uh, then that's what we're seeing right now. So we're not really even seeing physical objects. We're seeing bits of energy that have congregated to form these different colors and shapes and anatomy and et cetera, and very complicated variations. So it makes perfect sense that sound, once again, vibration, vibrational therapy, things of that nature go, and they literally physiologically shift you because you already are that vibration and that that series of energy all like gone together. So if you put different frequencies that resonate in different ways with those cells, like you can change anything in theory, right? Like yeah, totally endless possibility. Endless. And I don't mind the differentiation, just like, you know, an atom is differentiated by its particles. I don't mind the differentiation so much between like all the humans on the planet or all the fish on the planet, whether well, differentiation is useful, right? And once you be, once you are aware that you're just differentiated form of matter that everything else is made of too, all of a sudden the connection happens, right? And, and yeah. you go, oh yeah, it's, I'm just, you know, this bag of atoms, uh, Chris is this bat bag of atoms and here we are communicating what by vibration, right? Yeah. That's how we, we actually manage to get along in this world, voice, sight touch, whatever. It's, it's all just vibration. And mm -hmm. what a marvelous thing to find that commonality together with like everybody else who's around you and, and to appreciate the diversity of it. I, there's a whole subject, but you know, at it, it, the end of the day, we're all doing pretty well for differentiated atoms. Yeah, we are. All things considered, you know, we've, we've gone this far. What, how long has it been? 4.5 billion years, something like that. The earth has been around. A lot amount of time. Yeah. And uh, we're a couple hundred thousand of that. And, and it's not too bad. You know, we, we did things like the pyramids. Pretty cool. Or, or something happened, right? And, uh, you know, we've, we've got this technology and, you know, Tesla came along. So there, there's cool things happening. Oh, yeah. Considered, you know? Absolutely. And um, so I'm not too concerned about the the conflict. Okay. So if big pharma tries to shut down right frequencies, so, so what, you know, people are still going to find them. They're still going to use them. We have the internet. We can find anything now and, mm -hmm. you know, do your research, find out what, where you can play around with stuff and see if it's helpful. If it is, then use that, you know, there's so, so much stuff. And, and the, what I love about music is it's, it is that universal language, you know, like that's probably why yeah. everyone with all of our, all of our differences and which make us really awesome. I wouldn't want to be in a world where we're all the same. It's boring. Yeah. Um, you know, like I like variation. And so when we come together at a concert and you got every walk of life there, that's because we're coming together for the music. Cause it's that universal language that every soul resonates with every body. You know what I mean? It's all vibration. It's all that. It's a common language. It's, um, it's a universal language. So maybe that's we, why we love we it. We need to hear, I mean, it's the tree falling in the forest thing, right? But 
I think we need to hear. And certainly as musicians, we get this. Like it's much better to play for a room full of people who get it than for an empty room. Yeah. Right. With the exception of the Great Pyramids. Sure. It'd be an empty room that'd be cool to play in. <laughs> yes. And I might go out of my body playing there. So. <laughs> so there you go. So you wouldn't even be there any, anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like this ability to connect around something that's so powerful and so fundamental to who we are is, um, is a huge responsibility, Chris. I take it pretty seriously. You know, it means sitting down and playing a note in the middle of Balboa Park. And most of the time, it's just the ducks who are listening, right? But <laughs> it doesn't matter. But they love it. You know, they do. I've had I had a couple come and like sleep next to the keyboard. Oh my god! It's the weirdest dang thing, and you've seen the videos. But you know that responsibility of offering sound is uh, is huge and very profound. You know, that's why I love these talks because it gets me pumped for everything I'm I'm doing in the week. You know, with with my music, yeah. the getting that moving forward and and helping more people and. Just, you know, it, it really is all about that. It's it's for the love of it. And it's for also the the real need and, and honestly a sense of urgency that I feel right now just to get this out to the masses as much as possible. Because, you know, everyone can heal themselves through just picking up an instrument and strumming along or playing along. And singing uh, along. Singing along. You don't even need an instrument. Just use your voice. Clapping, beating, clapping, whatever, beating, beatboxing. Anything. Yeah, whatever it is. Anything. Do it. If you just do it intentionally. And so... Um, yeah, let's spread that virus. I'm down with that one. You know, like let's, let's absolutely. Get <laughs> it's, it's highly contagious, a whole lot of fun, it very is. healthy and, um, and golly, uh, safe. <laughs> yeah. Safe right? as it gets. As safe as it safe. gets. You know? Just don't blow out your eardrums if you. Pour <laughs> and, yes. <laughs> like me at the concerts every, you know, summer. Basically. Yeah, exactly. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> get your protection. You'll enjoy it just as much. I, yeah. Use them and I do. <laughs> So, yes. yes. Thank you for listening in on our conversation and for taking time to show your appreciation with a like, share, or subscribe. Discussions of music, healing, and consciousness is a practice of spontaneity, and we welcome your comments, ideas, and questions. There are ways to connect with us in the show notes, so let us hear from you. Until next time, this is Bill Protzman along with Chris Noble wishing you great musical health. Samara Huchaya.